or not. Sorry, I lost my mouse. Good evening, residents of Everett, Washington. I would like to call to order the Everett City Council meeting of February 2nd, 2022. In accordance with the governor's Healthy Washington guidelines and to protect city employees and members of the public from transmission of COVID-19, the city council is conducting our weekly council meeting remotely. We are prepared to reopen the council chambers to public meetings when public health considerations indicate it is safe to do so. There are several ways in which you can engage with the council and participate in our meetings. You may watch or participate in the remote meetings by watching live on Comcast Channel 21 or Frontier Channel 29. You may watch live online at www.everettwa.gov backslash city council, where you may also watch past meetings. You may call in to listen to the live meeting at any point by dialing 425-616-3920, conference ID 724-887-726 pound. You may find the public comment registration form on the City of Everett website under the City Council Department. Once you go to register here to provide comment via Zoom, you'll need to fill the form out completely if you wish to provide a public comment at a future meeting. After the public comment form is submitted, you'll receive an email confirmation with the Zoom link and the phone number to the meeting. Participants must submit this form at least 30 minutes prior to the meeting. Forms submitted after that time will not receive the Zoom link and number to speak but may still participate the day of the meeting by submitting comments and writing to council at everettwa.gov. For assistance, please contact the council office at 425-257-8703 or email Deb Williams at dwilliams at everettwa.gov. And please note that we do not allow comments on any kind of campaigning, whether for or against ballot measures or candidates running for office. We also do not accept comments focused on personal matters that are unrelated to city business. Outside of our meetings, members of the public are always welcome to contact council members or provide comments or concerns on any matter via email at council at everettwa.gov or by calling the city council office. Uh, clerk, will you please take the roll? Mayor Franklin? Here. Council member Zarlingo? Here. Council member Ryan? Here. Council member Vogley? Here. Council Member Schwab. Here. Council Member Fossey. Here. Council Member Tui. Here. President Stone Cipher. Here. I would like to call on Council Member Ryan to lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Thank you. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. And I would like to call on uh, Council Member Fossey to please read the land acknowledgement. Thank you. We acknowledge the original inhabitants of this place, the Shatohobes people and their successors, the Tulalip tribes. Since time immemorial, they have hunted, fished, gathered on and taken care of these lands and waters. We respect their sovereignty, their right to self-determination, and honor their sacred spiritual connection with the land and water. We will strive to be honest about our past mistakes and bring about a future that includes their people, stories, and voices to form a more just and equitable society. Thank you. Uh, do I have a motion for approval of the minutes of the January 26th uh, council meeting. Council Member Zarlingo uh, moves for approval of the minutes of the January 26th meeting. Thank you. Do I hear a second? Council Member Tui seconds the motion. Thank you. We have a motion and a second. Clerk, will you please take the roll? Council Member Zarlingo? Yes. Council Member Ryan? Yes. Council Member Vogley? Yes. Council Member Schwab? Yes. Council Member Fossey? Yes. Council Member Tui? Yes. President Jones Cipher? Yes. Thank you. And we'll move on to Mayor Franklin. Good evening, Mayor. 
Yeah, good evening, Council President and Council Members. I have just a couple of things. I'm asking for your concurrence on a few appointments to our boards and commissions. I'll start with cultural arts uh, to position four, Colton Davis for a six-year term and position two, Alfonza Leopold for a six-year term. And then to the LTAC board, uh, Tia Wincha for a six-year term. So I would need a motion for that. Do we hear a motion to approve the nominees Council, to the board? Council member Tui makes a motion to accept the nominees from the mayor for LTAC and the cultural commission. Vogelie seconds. We have a motion and a second. Uh, Clerk, will you please take the roll? Council member Zarlingo? Yes. Council member Ryan? Yes. Council member Vogelie? Yes. Council member Schwab? Yes. Council member Fossey? Yes. Council member Tui? Yes. President Stone Cipher? Yes. Uh, thank you. We still have, uh, I believe, just the Planning Commission, and I look forward to bringing that back to you hopefully next week or, or shortly thereafter. And then additionally, I wanted to let you know that our CHIP Loan Review Committee uh, member appointment doesn't require council approval, but I just wanted to let you know that I'm appointing Joel Hack to position uh, three for a four-year term. If you don't know, this committee is the advisory to the CHIP program that we have. They advise the CHIP program on a number of issues and they work to either approve or deny uh, housing rehabilitation loans and general contractor applicants bidding on CHIP housing rehabilitation jobs. So that's the purpose of that committee. And for whatever reason, it's one of those committees that I can just appoint, but I wanted to let you know about that appointment. And with that, I have no further comment this evening. Thank you. We'll move on to council comments and liaison reports, starting with council members Arlingo. Uh, yes, I am unmuted. <laughs> okay. A uh, couple of quick things. Um, with respect to the health district, uh, no major news there that you don't already have. Some encouraging reductions in infections and hospitalization. Sobering though that that, uh, that includes reductions to levels that we would previously have seen is pretty extreme. Um, I've also been working to get underway in organizing the uh, transit committee, collecting and reviewing um, broader and historic information and updates and we'll be working with the uh, committee members in the days to come to both get that uh, committee underway and uh, do it in a way that's in conformance with the open public meetings act as we uh, as we refine that process as well that's it for me for now my apologies thank you uh, council member ryan great good evening um, as folks probably know we had our council retreat on Friday and I was really encouraged by the work that we all put into it and the focus to put people first and uh, folks in Everett first uh, when it comes to interacting with uh, our neighbors and just making sure that council is being transparent and accountable so I was really grateful for the conversation. Uh, I had a chance to join the parks board earlier this week and uh, the parks board Parks board has a, a large number of new folks so I just wanted to uh, welcome Erica Diaz. Monica Sarvis, Will Kagi, and Jacob Close, the newest members of the Parks Board, and they have a really impressive background, so I know they're going to bring a lot of uh, really great talent to the board, and I'm um, so glad to have them there. Uh, I was going to share with them the pros plan, but uh, since they already worked through all of it last year, there wasn't really much need for me to go into detail on that, so uh, since they're going to be wrapping up uh, we are wrapping up the pros plan work. They're going to be moving to quarterly meetings. So looking forward to joining for that. Uh, Steph uh, was there to share more about the mini hydroplane event that uh, usually happens each summer at Silver Lake. And the board made a motion to open public comments over the next uh, couple of months. The park staff is going to be reaching out to uh, the neighbors in, at Silver Lake and Everett at large to um, ask for public comment about how folks, uh, if they would like to continue the hydro, mini hydroplane races or things that they would like to see differently. So keep your eyes peeled for opportunities to, to um, provide public comment about how you feel about the mini uh, hydroplane races at uh, Silver Lake. And then also at their April meeting, uh, they'll be open for in-person public comments if folks would like to join uh, virtually, I assume, to, to share their thoughts. Um, and then just wanted to excuse me, send a friendly reminder that uh, the ballots are out for the February 8th special election and uh, so they're due on Tuesday by 8 p.m. And there's two ballot measures on there for the replacement levies for the school district. And so I just encourage everybody to exercise the right to participate in a free and fair election. 
And uh, two last things I'd like to say, Gong Hei Fat Choi, or Happy Lunar New Year and Happy Year of the Tiger to everybody, and also a Happy Black History Month to everybody. I know there's a countless ways that the Black community has contributed to our national culture and our community right here in Everett. And so I just want to take a quick moment to share my continuing commitment to equity and inclusion and to ensure that policy decisions moving forward don't disproportionately impact communities of color because it's the right thing to do and because Black Lives Matter. So thank you very much. Those are my comments for tonight. Thank you. Councilmember Vogley. Good evening, everybody. Um, I had the fantastic opportunity to meet with Brian Surratt and Tina Velocity of LISC, or Local Initiative Support Corporation, concerning the Web Triangle, or Westmont Holly Evergreen Boeing Triangle, that encompasses a rather large part of District 4. I felt truly grateful that this company reached out to our city. Uh, there's much economic and residential development coming to Southwest Everett, and the LISC group will be working for the underserved communities, helping to ensure that development does not equal displacement. Uh, to quote their website, together with residents and partners, we forge resilient and inclusive communities of opportunity across America. Great places to live, work, visit, do business, and raise families. I'm very excited to hear more about the outreach and relationship building as it happens. Um, and the past two days have been filled with information from the Law and Mental Health Conference. This year's focus is on alternatives to police. Uh, folks from CAHOOTS, whom I've mentioned before, out of Eugene, Oregon, Atlanta-based Policing Alternatives and Diversion Initiative, Oakland's Urban Strategy Council, and more. Uh, Councilmember Fossey also attended. I'm sure we'll both have more to report as we continue to process the information. And uh, yes, happy Black History Month, and Black History is, is now, is current events. So um, have a wonderful month and a wonderful night. That's all I have. Thank you. Council Member Schwab. Yeah, just a couple of things. Um, the state legislature is um, moving very quickly. Uh, tomorrow is the last day to pass the bill out of committee. So we'll see how that thing shape up there. And I had an opportunity on Monday to attend the downtown um, Everett Association. And it was good to see how that community the downtown businesses were very optimistic about this upcoming year. That's all, thank you. Thank you. Council Member Fossey. Thanks. Uh, so a few updates. Um, just start off by seconding everything Council Member Ryan just said, and uh, I'll be make it a little bit shorter. Um, I was able to also uh, attend um, the Snohomish County tomorrow. Um, I'm an alternate, but I got to uh, attend and kind of observe. Um, there was a report from the Puget Sound Regional Council folks uh, that they recently released a regional transportation plan, which they're looking for comment, and the Economic Alliance, Snohomish County has new board leadership, uh, and basically they just approved their annual dues and discussed their 2022 um, work program, which I'm looking forward to getting more copy up on some of those things. Uh, I did attend the uh, Law and Mental Health Conference, uh, and uh, yeah, it was definitely um, a lot of information to digest and a very informative like dive in on those mental health alternatives uh, to police programs and kind of approaches across the nation that have had um, been seeing success. So um, that'll be helpful going forward and, and um, working with folks and just kind of seeing, you know, what's working out there that maybe we can look at too. Uh, I was also able to uh, go to the Downtown Everett Association annual meeting, and they did a kind of an overview of the DEA and uh, talked about some really awesome things happening downtown and uh, I believe that their work plan going forward. Um, lastly, I wanted to uh, bring up uh, the letter that was provided to my colleagues uh, that was put together by the League of Women Voters um, recommending adoption of the proposed new policy on the urban tree canopy um, into the general policy plan um, during for the process for the 2024 update to the Snohomish County Growth Management Act comp plan. 
uh, they had received assistance from the county in crafting uh, it. And I know Snohomish County Council Member Dunn will be bringing it forward um, fairly quickly. So there it is, does have a timestamp on it. Um, and we need to get the letter uh, out or they need to by the 15th of this month because um, she's going to do a possible amendment to the 2024 comp plan. Uh, there was, as you saw, a long list of uh, endorsers on there, uh, including the city of Snohomish. Uh, so with that in mind, along with our commitment to uh, address climate change, uh, I want to move this letter forward for consideration that we endorse this letter. And I would need a second. I'll second for uh, conversations. Thank you. Uh, so under our current council procedures, we have two council members who would like to work on um, drafting this legislation to bring forward. And it sounds like it would need to come on next week's agenda. Um, if you need to get it before the 14th or 15th, did you say? Um, so is that correct? Council, council president, I, mm -hmm. I think that uh, council member Fossey is not asking for legislation, but for uh, a vote on whether we can sign on to this letter that already exists. Great. I saw the letter, but so there's there would be no, we don't have to do any other uh, a resolution with regard to right. that. It would just be a matter of us approving that. Correct. And we you can do that tonight or you can put it off until next week. Your choice. I would like, I think I'd like to put it on the formal agenda so that our residents and citizens have a chance to see that we would take action on that. We may have some that would like to comment on that and weigh in. But um, so we'll put that on next week's agenda and um, I'll work with Deb Williams to make sure that it's going to be there um, for our consideration next week. And I, so the Kate Lunsford is also um, here uh, able to provide public comment today if anyone did want to have questions about it too. Great. Thank you. I would like that if I may. <laughs> um, do we get to talk about it at all tonight? Uh, we certainly can. I'll go down the roll if you'd like, although since you were the seconder of the motion, go ahead and make your comments and then I'll yes. go down the roll. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks, Mary. I'm sorry. Thank you, Council Member Fossey. Um, I did not read through all of it yet, so I'm actually happy to have it be till next week. But my question is, it's for the county's comprehensive plan, correct? So we're signing on to a letter possibly to encourage the county to put an amendment in for a tree canopy and all of the things that are in this, correct? Okay. Well, I do have support for it for sure. That's all. Yes, that was my understanding. Councilmember Vogley and Councilmember Fossey, my understanding of the um, role this would play in the county's comp plan is it would be one of the countywide planning policies. And under the Growth Management Act, that means that when we do our comp plan, uh, we would need to take that into consideration in drafting our comp plan. Thank you for that clarification. Sure. Great. Uh, I'm going to go down the roll. Um, next, we'll go to Councilmember Zerlingo. I had a chance to go through that, at least to look through it. There are some three dozen policies and objectives in there, and uh, I'm appreciating the chance to look at that before uh, making any other comment uh, at next week's meeting. Thank you. Councilmember Ryan? Thanks. Yeah, The um, so at the county level, the county council members have the opportunity to, to initiate a, an amendment to the GPP. So that's what uh, this work has been doing. And I'll have to work with um, legal to determine whether or not I can vote on it because it might, might be a bit of a conflict of interest for me. So, um, but yeah, it, I can vouch for <laughs> the validity of it. And um, it's, it's supporting a overall, overall goals to enhance our tree canopy in Snohomish County and therefore in Everett. So it, it's a really great policy. Great, thank you. And we'll go, Councilmember Vogley spoke. We'll go to Councilmember Schwab. Um, yes, I'm just looking forward to reading through all it and see um, what the impact of it would be. So I appreciate the week too to go through the information. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Tui. Uh, I don't have any questions or comments tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And I think um, this 
sounds uh, like a great thing to put on our agenda for next week for consideration. And I would only ask that we have a staff report on sort of what, how this impacts the city's comp plan um, uh, process. And uh, at that time, as this time, that's the only question I have. Mayor Franklin, would you like to weigh yeah, in on thanks. this? <laughs> yeah, thank you, uh, Council President Stonecipher. That was actually uh, kind of close to my comment. Staff haven't had the opportunity. We, we just received it, I think, yesterday or, or today. I can't remember, but thank you for forwarding it, uh, Council Member Fossey. We haven't had the opportunity to review it, so don't yet know what the uh, cost impact would be, resources or staff uh, that we would need to implement this. And so, um, we will work to get that by next week uh, to all of you to inform your vote on whether council should sign this. Um, but uh, yeah, we haven't had that opportunity yet. So uh, we'll do our best to get that to you by next week. Very well, thank you. Uh, where are we in our agenda? That was council member Fossey's report. And was that all you had council member Fossey? Go to Council Member Tui. Uh, I don't have any report tonight. Thank you. Thank you. And I do not have a report. Do we have an update from administration? Uh, President Stonecipher? Yes. We do have one community member who has signed up to speak on this topic. Thank you. Let's have them come forward, please. There wasn't a topic, though. Would we have them speak during regular? Uh, comment based time. on the discussion regarding last Friday, it was to allow them to speak when the topic came on. And it is Kate Lunsford who has signed up to speak. I hope I'm saying her name correctly. Please remember to unmute yourself and please turn on your camera if possible. And please limit your comment to three minutes. Kate. Thank you. Thanks so much. My name is Kate Lunsford and I'm speaking on behalf of the League of Women Voters of Snohomish County. P.O. Box 1146 Everett, Washington 98206. I'm here tonight to ask the City Council to endorse the letter to Snohomish County Council supporting the urban tree canopy policy proposed by CM Dunn for adoption into the Snohomish County Comprehensive Plan updated, as you've heard. We're at a crossroads in our county where growth and, and can overwhelm our natural systems. This policy will create a framework for assessing, um, accessing resources to protect and enhance urban tree canopy to bring its tremendous benefits to our lives and environment. The policy language is guided by the Evergreen Community Act in Washington state law. It's been reviewed and revised by legal experts and county staff. The policy gives jurisdictions the ability to tap technical support from the Washington Department of Natural Resources to respond to climate justice. Tools include tree assessment, tree inventory, forestry plans, surface water management, uh, public education, and guidance on ordinances and incentives. The Evergreen Community Act is similar to the National Tree City designation, but is specific to Washington State. Uh, urban tree programs can bring economic benefit to property owners. Uh, trees um, and, and natural areas are highly valued by home buyers. Jobs can be created around management of urban forests and may be eligible for funding from the American Rescue Plan and Washington's Community Forestry Assistance Grants. The city of Everett certainly has strong support for volunteerism needed in urban forestry plans. The skills and passion of your neighborhood associations and the support for Green Everett work parties show there's, there are willing hands for these programs. We think the community countywide hungers for opportunities too. Uh, you saw the list of endorsers and I'm so excited to say that the city of Snohomish and the mayor uh, voted unanimously last night to, uh, to sign the letter and Future Wise, Puget Soundkeeper, Washington Physicians for Social Responsibility, the Climate Alliance of Snohomish County, Interfaith Climate Action, the Delta Neighborhood Association, 350 Everett and others. So I would ask to please help Snohomish County bring these resources to our community by signing this letter of endorsement. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for your service. Thank you for your comments, we appreciate it. President Stonecipher, that's all I have, thank you. 
Thank you. And Council President Sunsever, I have a quick admin yes. update. And, and I'm, I'm going to tag team with you. So I want you to correct me if I'm not re reflecting this correctly, but I wanted to just talk for a moment about the next steps with the retreat. I know you and I spoke earlier this week and I didn't have a chance to talk with you too much tonight, but um, the bottom line is that staff are working, I'm working with legal to, to work on the new council procedures based on the input that came from our retreat and that will come back to council. Um, uh, I, I envision, I, I think we envision language that speaks to the concept of committee liaisons and general language in the council procedures, but then a separate guiding document that speaks more specifically to these particular committee liaison structures for the year. So it's not embedded in the, the council procedures document. Um, I know council, council members are reaching out to department heads and administration and their companion council liaisons uh, with Deb's help to schedule meetings. I know there was talk about getting that done um, initially by the end of this week and then in March uh, the council chair is coming back and discussing kind of the beginning of the committee work um, until we bring back the draft documents. I, you know, I think the plan was we would continue to be doing business as usual as we have as a council so that uh, council as a whole has an opportunity to talk about um, any changes to those council procedures or the agenda order. Um, the public comment those things that were discussed at the retreat. I think the goal was to bring bring back all of that within the next month or so after legals helped uh, create some draft materials for council's input. So did I get close to, to what where I think we are with the retreat next steps? Yes, I think that sounds uh, like a good um, a good pathway. Thanks. That, that no other uh, admin update. Thank you. Great, thank you. Um, and I didn't have any comments. I just will report I'm going to be absent at next week's uh, council meeting and council member Tui will be uh, chairing that meeting in my absence. Hmm. Uh, City Attorney Hall, what do you have for us this evening? I don't have anything to report and there is no executive session. Thank you. Thank you. Deb Williams, have we received any further comments from the community for public comment? Good evening, President Stonecipher. We have no written comment and we have no one else waiting to speak. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll move on to the consent agenda. Do I hear a motion to approve the three consent items? Council Member Tui moves the consent items. Do I hear a second? Ogilvy seconds. Thank you. We have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda. Clerk, will you please take the roll? Council members Arlingo? Yes. Council member Ryan? Yes. Council member Vogley? Yes. Council member Schwab? Yes. Council member Fossey? Yes. Council member Tui? Yes. President Stone Cipher? Yes. Now we'll move to our action items. Uh, item four, authorize the mayor to execute the settlement agreement with Jason Anderson in the amount of $375,000. Do I hear a motion? Council member Tui moves the motion. Ogilvy seconds. We have a motion and a second. Let's go down the roll to see if there are any questions or comments. Starting that with council members Arlingo. Uh, no questions or comments. I've reviewed the document and have no more questions or comments. Thank you. Council member Ryan. No more questions or comments. Thanks. Council member Vogley. I also have no questions or comments. Council Member Schwab? No questions, no comments, thank you. Council Member Fossey? No questions or comments, thank you. Council Member Tui? I have nothing here also. Nor do I. Clerk, will you please take the roll? Council Members Arlingo? Yes. Council Member Ryan? Yes. Council Member Bogley? Yes. Council Member Schwab? Yes. Council Member Fossey? Yes. Council Member Tui? Yes. President Stone Cipher? Yes. Item five, adopt the resolution for the 2022 Human Needs Funds recommendations. Do I hear a motion? Council Member Tui moves this motion. Council Member Fossey seconds. Thank you. We have a motion and a second to 
adopt the resolution for the Human Needs Fund. Let's go down the roll and see if we have questions or comments. Council Member Zarlingo. Uh, no, after the presentation, no further questions or comments. Thank you, Council Member Ryan. Oh yeah, thanks to staff for putting this all together and for their presentation last week and just looking forward to getting the dollars out the door and helping people in need in the community. Thanks everybody. Thank you, Council Member Folkley. Here, here, Council Member Ryan, get the money out the door. That's it. Council Member Schwab. No questions or comments, thank you. Council Member Fossey. I'm really excited for this to be a huge benefit to our community and yeah, money out the door, get things going. That's it. Thank you, Council Member Tui. Yeah, just wanna thank all the organizations who applied and are receiving money and thank you for your service to our community. It's, we just so appreciate it, thank you. Thank you, and I'll just echo the comments that were made by my colleagues. Clerk, will you please take the roll? Council Member Zarlingo? Yes. Council Member Ryan? Yes. Council Member Vogley? Yes. Council Member Schwab? Yes. Council Member Fossey? Yes. Council Member Tui? Yes. President Stonecipher? Yes. Item six, authorize the mayor to sign the professional services agreement with Brown and Caldwell Incorporated to provide engineering consulting services for the Port Gardner storage facility project for a total amount not to exceed $4,407,152. Do I hear a motion? Council member Tui makes the motion to move this item. Council member Schwab second. A motion in a second. Let's see if there are any questions or comments. Council Member Zarlingo? No questions or comments. Council Member Ryan? Yeah, I was wondering if st uh, staff is available to give a, a very brief overview of the project and uh, what all it would entail. Yeah, good evening, uh, Ryan South with Public Works. Be happy to do that. Uh, by way of just some uh, brief background, uh, the city of Everett is required by consent decree with Department of Ecology to bring our combined sewer overflows into compliance by 2027. Uh, the city purchased the K Kimberly Clark wastewater treatment plant uh, left over from the operations on the waterfront in July of 2019 toward uh, a program to achieve that compliance. Uh, in uh, August of 2021, uh, City Council adopted an ordinance to, uh, to authorize funding of $39.6 million as initial uh, design and demolition work for the program. This contract is the first contract toward fulfilling uh, that, that program. It's about an $85 to $100 million program. This contract is to do uh, full uh, engineering design for demolition of parts of that existing plant and to do preliminary design for a complete new uh, facility to store combined sewer uh, overflows and then meter them back into our system as opposed to allowing them to go out the combined sewer overflows. Thank you, Ryan. Great. Thank you, no more questions. Thank you. Uh, Council Member Vogley. I, it's mostly a comment. I'm noticing that this is just shy of the $5 million threshold for PLAs. And I'm just putting that on the radar out there because it looks, or you just said like 85 to 100 million. So there may be plenty of opportunity for a, a PLA or a CWA to, um, move forward in all of these sewer improvements. That's all, thank you. Thank you, Council Member Schwab. Uh, thank you for the update, no questions or comments. Council Member Fossey. Well, Council Member Vogley started in on uh, where my question was going. Uh, is this a type of project that would normally qualify for that if that threshold had hit 5 million? The, uh, if I understand correctly, that would come into play when we have the construction work going, which would be over that 5 million threshold. And then 
those projects that are eligible would be considered for uh, PLA or, or other uh, ways of adopt uh, other ways of complying with that ordinance. Thank you, Councilmember Tui. I don't have any further questions. Thank you. Thank you, Ryan, for uh, sharing that update briefing, I should say. Thank you, and I appreciate my uh, fellow council members' questions, and I don't have any further questions. Uh, Clerk, will you please take the roll? Council Member Zarlingo? Yes. Council Member Ryan? Yes. Council Member Vogley? Yes. Council Member Schwab? Yes. Council Member Fossey? Yes. Council Member Tui? Yes. President Stone Cipher? Yes move on to the council briefing agenda these items come before the city council serving as a council committee of the whole and are likely to be scheduled at a future meeting item seven washington state department of transportation briefing on the i-5 concrete pavement and bridge joint replacement project and i believe ryan sass is here to help us with this yes thank you i wanted to introduce adam M Adam Emerson and the WASHDOT team to provide a briefing to council. They have a maintenance project along I-5 within the Everett city limits that uh, would like to have council briefed regarding. It'll have some uh, effects on the city and Corey Hurt, city traffic engineer is also available to help answer questions. All right, good evening council. Uh, Mayor, thank you for having us here tonight. Uh, my name is Adam Emerson. As Ryan said, I am the project engineer who is overseeing the design and development of the I-5 Portland Cement Concrete Panel and Bridge Joint Replacement Project. I apologize for the mouthful. Um, I am also a resident of the city of Everett. I live down uh, in the South End around the Silver Lake area. So I appreciate the opportunity to come and uh, present to you on a project that is right in my backyard as well. So. With me tonight are a couple other representatives from DOT. We've got Tom Pierce, who is the public information officer in charge of leading communications on all the Revive I-5 jobs through King and Snohomish counties, uh, as well as Sean Wendt, who will be the project engineer overseeing the actual construction of this project when it is uh, uh, out in the field. So before I dive too deep into what the actual project is, I did want to take every, uh, a moment just to familiarize everyone with the, the area that's going to be impacted. So the enlarged photo there on the right um, kind of indicates that this is a project along I-5. Uh, our project limits run from um, approximately Lowell Road to the south, uh, all the way up to the Snohomish River in the north. Um, our project will take place on the northbound lanes of I-5 only, so southbound should remain unaffected throughout the project. One thing I do want to mention is that uh, this is an extremely long area. Uh, we recognize that, but this whole area won't necessarily be affected at the same time. We have separate stages of construction. These limits are just uh, the ones that encompass all of the panels and all of the bridge joints um, within the scope to be replaced. Um, so now that we're familiar with the location, uh, I'll dive into kind of the, the what and the why behind our project. So first off, why are we doing this project? Well, the purpose behind this work will be to preserve and maintain I-5 uh, so that we reduce the risk of having any unanticipated or catastrophic failures of the roadway if we had another heat dome or a severe freeze. Um, in the event of those catastrophic failures, you know, we would see an increased risk to the traveling public. You know, we would see a higher impact on traffic than this project will bring, as well as fixing those emergency situations, very costly undertaking. So we're doing this work in an effort to try and avoid that in the future. And what we'll be doing is replacing or repairing uh, 108 concrete panels uh, within the project limits. We'll also be doing some pretty extensive pavement grinding to prolong the life of panels that we're not replacing, as well as make it a slightly smoother ride. Uh, and we're replacing eight expansion joints across four bridges. Uh, the, the pictures that are there on the, the right-hand side of the screen show what this work kind of usually looks like. Uh, these are pictures that were taken from very similar projects that occurred over the last couple of years down in King County. Um, 
I do want to, to also note that this work in Everett is being combined with a project uh, out on I-90 between North Bend and Issaquah that has a very similar scope. And while that portion that's out um, on I-90 will certainly not have any direct traffic or construction impacts uh, on the work occurring in Everett, it does potentially have an impact on the schedule, which is why I bring it up. So um, our next slide is a high level overview of our, of our schedule uh, thus far. The, the black dates shown are actuals, the green are projected dates. So one can see that this, this project is currently out on advertisement for, for industry to take a look at. Uh, we are hoping to, hope, yes, we're hoping to open bids uh, in early March. And if bids come back reasonable, we could have a contractor uh, awarded by April. Um, what I can't exactly speak to today is when uh, council should expect to see work in Everett specifically. And, and the reason behind that is because WashDOT, you know, similar to most public agencies, we really try to limit the direction of means and methods for our contractors when we put a contract out. Um, they are the experts in their field. They do this type of work all the time. So we, we rely on that expertise to help us get more efficient schedules, better prices, um, and, and to allow more companies to, to try and bid on and win the work. But what that means for, for this project specifically is that Washington elected not to um, set a particular order in which this work had to be done. Once a contractor comes on board, it is um, as likely that they can choose to work on the I-5 portion first, as it would be to work on the I-90, or they could um, run two projects in tandem if that was what worked most efficiently for them. Uh, once we do get a contractor on board, though, we should have a much better idea of what this schedule look like and, looks like, and we will uh, make a concentrated effort to communicate that, not only with you know, the stakeholders who are impacted, but the, the community at large. Um, so that everyone knows when these, these, these impacts are going to occur. Uh, all that said, we're showing right now an expected construction schedule that begins in the second quarter of this year uh, and could last all the way through the end of the first quarter, 2023. That being said, um, as I'm sure everyone's aware, there's a lot of turmoil within the industry right now uh, due to supply chain issues, staffing shortages for contractors, uh, the regional concrete strikes, those in conjunction with things such as very weather dependent activities uh, do all pose a risk to this schedule and could extend it further into 2023, although we're going to do everything we can to, to try and make sure that doesn't happen. Um, so while we may not be able to uh, say exactly when this work is happening in Everett just yet, uh, we do know what that will look like and what it will be or what will be the, the most impactful piece. So to touch on that real quick, the most impactful piece of this work is actually the, the bridge joint replacements. And, and the reason for that is in order for us to successfully chip out, remove, replace, and then finish uh, one of those bridge joints, it takes a pretty substantial amount of time. And we have to close half of the roadway uh, in order to accomplish it. And that's not just half of the travel lanes, that is half of the entire roadway from the edge of edge of shoulder to edge of shoulder. Um, so to accomplish this, you know, we've worked with our construction folks as well as our, our bridge design folks and determined that the, the most efficient way to do that will be to allow um, continuous lane closures of I-5 uh, across nine weekends during the contract. And what that will look like is from about 10 p.m. on Friday to 5 a.m. on Monday, the contractor will be permitted to shut down all but two lanes in the northbound direction um, during the, the daylight hours and, and will be able to further reduce it down to one lane during the, the nighttime hours. In addition to the lane closures, um, during those weekends, we also expect there to be need to be some ramp closures that will help facilitate both the bridge and the panel replacement work, as well as to ensure that our or traffic control um, meets proper safety standards. In advance of these long weekend closures, um, we, 
the residents and, and yourselves will probably see some weak night closures of lanes, shoulders, and even ramps just to prep for that work, do some restriping, uh, potentially even do some panel replacements. Um, now that's only about a 50,000 foot view of our, our traffic control. I don't wanna to get too far into the weeds on it, but I, I do wanna take a moment just to acknowledge that we understand closures like this, especially of such a major arterial like I-5 are impactful, not only to the freeway users, but also to the surrounding community. Um, it is our expectation in setting up this project that it will look and feel a lot like the Snow Coast Squeeze project from a few years ago, where we were replacing bridge joints over Steamboat Slough, just south of Marysville. Uh, we have similar closures, similar hours. We'll probably see similar um, congestion through that time. The primary difference from my perspective, though, is that this is occurring much nearer and, and through Everett proper. And so there are other roads and other paths that drivers may elect to take uh, if they, they don't uh, want to sit in traffic on the freeway. It is certainly, and it will not be WashDOT's intent to direct any traffic off of the freeway and onto the local network. Uh, we will be undergoing a pretty large communications campaign to try and avoid that. However, the reality of our industry is that with all these uh, mapping apps and traffic apps, folks are finding ways to avoid uh, the, the congested areas. And so, uh, you know that's, that's often to the detriment of the, the surrounding community. That being said, like, uh, like I mentioned, we are undertaking a very large public communications campaign uh, in advance of any of these weekend closures. We are going to be advocating for behavioral changes such as uh, delaying a trip, not taking a trip, taking it earlier or later in the day, taking different modes such as transit or carpool, um, or, or even taking a different state route such as, such as SR9 um, without diverting people onto these local neighborhood sorts of routes. Um, as beneficial as we hope that approach will be and as beneficial as it has been on our previous Revive I-5 projects, uh, we do expect there to be some diversion traffic onto the city streets. Uh, we've been working very closely with the, the public work staff and especially your signals group to make sure that we give enough advance warning of the project that uh, your staff has time to make the necessary adjustments to signals, uh, to signing, to make sure that um, any flow that, that does divert from the freeway over onto the local roads uh, is uh, handled as, as efficiently as possible without people taking uh, you know, neighborhood, neighborhood streets, excuse me. Um, all that said, I think Corey can probably speak more to what the city is doing specifically. Um, and while I am, am acutely aware of what we're trying to accomplish with all of our messaging, I am not a communicator, I'm an engineer. So um, it, to talk a little bit more about how we're going to accomplish that and the platforms we'll be using to communicate with, um, with, with this community, uh, Tom Pierce is here to present our next slide. So, Tom. Thank you, Adam. Uh, thank you, council members, and thank you, Mayor, for having us here tonight. Uh, we have a robust communications plan for this project. We are going to have two communication specialists that are working on it, myself and another. Uh, we have a project website that has already been posted. Uh, Actually, I'm sorry, I might be mistaken on that. This time of year, we're doing a lot of project websites, but it, it should be up soon if it's not already. So we will use social media real, very heavily. Uh, we have about a half a million Twitter followers. We are very active on Facebook and can provide plenty of information on there and opportunities for people to communicate with us. We're also involved in other platforms, you know, Instagram. Uh, we've even done a couple of TikTok videos. So uh, we're doing everything we can to reach out and talk to the public about this. Of course, we're going to use the traditional media as well. Uh, we want to work with the local paper, uh, the local TV stations, because they're very helpful in getting the word out. Uh, we have other resources too. Uh, we have our overhead message signs on the freeway that, of course, we'll be messaging on those. 
our key goal in the communication is going to be to get about half the traffic, half the people who would drive across this to do something else. Uh, because we're, we're basically cutting the available lanes in half. So that's the goal of our communication plan. Reduce the number of people who are out there. Make sure that people are aware of this. Make sure they know about alternatives and that they can plan ahead. So that's what we have for communications on this. And with that, uh, I'll hand it back to you, Adam. Excellent, thanks, Tom. Um, so that's about the 50,000 foot overview of this project. Uh, there's been a lot of time and effort that gone into to, to planning for it. So uh, I'm sure we could get as detailed as you, you want to, but we wanted to keep it high clip and just let you know what was coming um, your way and, and what your residents should uh, prepare for over the coming months. Uh, but with that, you know, again, we, we thank you for your time. And if you have any questions, we'd be happy to try and answer them. Thank you, Adam. Let's go down the council roll and see what questions our council members have, starting with council members Arlingo. Thank you. Uh, several quick things. Uh, one of them is, uh, are you working with uh, the city, with administration essentially on any major city plans of a major city event that might be affected by traffic that diverts around this? Uh, I guess I just want to request that 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 link stays live as the schedule evolves so that if there is anything that uh, goes on uh, where, where schedule where schedules might conflict that we uh, uh, that we uh, see that coming. Um, uh, Two quick questions about the project physically. Uh, one of them is, uh, is I-5 holding up like we expect it to? You know, this is periodic maintenance, I suspect, but is there anything going on here that, that we should know about that reflects any, um, any unusual deterioration or anything else we might see coming? And uh, secondly, is this pretty much like what we've seen as drivers on all the previous uh, expansion joint and panel replacements? Sure. Um, again, I'll try and hit those in order. Apologies if I miss something. Please just remind me if I do. As, as far as coordination goes with the city uh, around events, we did do, we have done outreach and included in our contract a number of, of items that uh, preclude the contractor from working uh, during those weekends or during those events. Uh, pretty much anything at Angel of the Winds Arena uh, with, a, with an attendance over 5,000 is going to preclude them from working. Um, another, uh, a large number of other events such as the, um, I think Lake Stevens Aquafest is in there, things all the way up to the, the Tula Festival. Uh, so we, we've, we've taken a regional approach to trying to get folks not to work. Uh, the last conversation we had with the city staff, there were not any events uh, that we hadn't already captured that we needed to be uh, aware of, but if those come up, we're certainly happy to to maintain the communication oh, and, and see what great we Great to hear your thinking on that. Thank you. Of course, uh, as far as how I-5 is held up, if there's anything that, that you need to be aware of, no, this is relatively routine maintenance. Um, there were a number of areas across the entire region during Heat Dome this summer that experienced some um, some, some panels popping out and, and needed some emergency work. Those were uh, incredible circumstances that caused that. But as far as kind of what we expect on a regular basis, uh, we don't have any knowledge of anything. Um, I don't have any knowledge and, and I don't think anyone else in Washington has any that would expect any um, pre or, or unexpected failures. It, I-5 has held up much better than one would have expected when it was originally built, given the lifetime that it was supposed to last. We are past that and still seeing um, uh, still seeing good productivity. Um, we just have to do work like this to maintain that it, uh, to maintain that level of service. So and I apologize. I think I forgot your last question. Uh, only that is there anything going to be done that's different than what we've seen as drivers in um, similar uh, maintenance operations? No, nope, it'll be pretty well the same. If you've seen a panel replacement job and, and bridge joint replacement job, uh, it will look very, very similar. Um, nothing that I can think of unless, uh, unless either Sean or Tom can think of anything different. Uh, I think it'll look pretty standard. Okay, we know the drill. Thank you. Thank you. Councilmember Ryan. 
Uh, thanks so much for your presentation. Appreciate the heads up and uh, keep it in mind and help, happy to help with pushing out that messaging too. I'd love to see if there's any way to um, help with translation services or even using the reader board to, uh, in different languages to make sure that folks on the roadway know what's coming down the pike. And um, yeah, I think we're going to be seeing quite a few more um, extreme weather <laughs> seasons for summers and winters. So I'm glad to see that this is happening ahead of time so that we're not having to deal with the emergency situation of a panel popping out. So I appreciate your uh, work and your collaboration. Thanks. Say, so, I'm sorry to jump in, but if I may say, I forgot that we certainly want to work with the city to do public outreach that we can provide messaging that the city can work with. So. Uh, just wanted to let you know that, and yeah, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Councilmember Vogley. Yes, thank you for this presentation. Um, I can't recall the map completely, so is it going to get in the way of Highway 2? Because it's northbound. <laughs> um, no. We, we have made we made a point of ensuring that our traffic control allows consistent access to eastbound US2. Um, obviously, westbound US2 wouldn't be affected since we're not going southbound. But um, we that is one of the major you know trip freight routes, one of the major uh, recreational routes. Uh, we recognize it's important at, its importance to to the region and to the state. So uh, it will be maintained throughout construction barring. Uh, something unforeseen. Um, yeah. Good to hear. Thank you. Um, I have a joke question and then a comment. Wow, getting half of the people that typically drive on the freeways off. Um, I personally very much encourage that and maybe they'll even stay off the road, but we've got to get better transit and <laughs> multimodality. And I'm not going to ask the joke question, but um, yeah, fantastic that Tom, you did mention. And I know that you have also Adam that working with the city and I'm sure administration would like that. Um, uh, yes, yeah, so that's all. Thank you for the update. Mm -hmm of what's to come. Thank you, Councilmember Schwab. That was very thorough, thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Fossey. No questions at this time. Uh, are you planning on sending updates via to the council, any other avenue or through the city? Is it? We'll be maintaining pretty close coordination with public work staff. Um, most of our, much like this one, the request to, to present to council uh, had actually originated with your staff. Um, so if there's a desire from council, uh, if there's a desire from staff for us to come back, uh, we'd be happy to. It might not be me, it might be Sean, since it'll likely be in construction at that point, but uh, uh, we're always happy to, to provide whatever information you need and to, to keep a good relationship. Thank you, yeah, email also works. So. <laughs> sure. Great, thank you. Council Member Tui. Yeah, I want to thank Adam and Tom for your presentation. Really appreciate that update. And, you know, Everett already has, if you're out in the middle of Everett, about 2.30 in the afternoon, you see a lot of people commuting through our city from work back home. So it should be interesting to see, because uh, they're trying to all skirt around any congestion. And so um, anyway, it'll be very interesting to see what routes they take and, and how they maneuver and and hopefully they'll take transit, but um, I, I'm not, <laughs> not too hopeful that half of them will. But anyway, thank you for that. And I look forward to more updates as we get going. Thank you. Thank you. And um, for, for my question, I just, I, I wanted to clarify, it's just, it's really just weekends that you're closing, right? From Friday to Sunday. There will be some closures during the week. However, those are all nighttime hours. Um, okay. They have no daytime closures on weekdays. Um, just can't accommodate that with the, the traffic on I-5. So yeah. the, the biggest impacts will certainly be the weekends. There will be some other work during nights uh, during the week. Okay. 
Yeah, I mean, I, I'm with uh, council member too. I'm a little concerned about the pass through traffic that is going to spill over into the community. We've just um, been, I mean, it already happens if, if the freeway's just jammed up. So um, we might have to do some thinking about, you know, how we can help to route or mitigate um, some of the some of that occurring within our city limits. I'm sure our city um, staff probably have some ideas about how to do that. Um, but anyway, uh, so Ryan, with your team, we'd love to hear uh, at some point what we're how we're planning on trying to help alleviate some of that spillover effect. Yeah, we can certainly do that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so Adam, Tom, thank you, and Sean, I didn't see you, but thanks so much for being here tonight, and giving us an update on this project. It sounds like a really important one, and um, we'll be glad when it, we're on the other side of it, uh, so we can keep people moving through the community. As will we. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Have you. a good evening. Uh, now we'll go to item eight on our briefing agenda, which is the Comprehensive Plan Periodic Update Project for the Everett 2044 Comprehensive Plan Update. And hi, Yorick, I see you there. We have. Good evening, Councilman. Yes, Yorick uh, Stevens watched you here. Yes, uh, good, good evening, Council President. Uh, thank you for having us. I'm Yorick Stevens watched a um, uh, planning director for the city. And with me is my colleague, uh, Rebecca McCreary, long range planning manager for the city. Um, and I think Becky is gonna run the slides. I don't see them yet got some coming up. So we're here to talk to you about uh, an exciting and uh, significant project, probably the most significant project that a planning department undertakes uh, periodic update to our city's comprehensive plan. And um, uh, this serves as somewhat of a project introduction. I believe uh, the council heard a, a, a briefing on this well in advance of us actually launching the project maybe a year or so ago before my time here. Um, but this kind of marks the official launch of a several year project. So we're excited to finally be at this point. Took a lot of preparation to try to scope out the work program and uh, resources and start to gather some of the initial information that we'll need to conduct this update and all that is ongoing. Uh, but importantly, uh, this is a time to uh, orient you, the council uh, and others watching to this project and it will be the first of, of many briefings. Uh, Becky, if you go to the next slide. So we will cover just a little bit of a background and an overview of the project, uh, touch on our anticipated process and schedule, briefly touch on what we understand the council's role to be, and then have some time to answer any question and hear uh, any initial feedback that, that you might have. Um, if you looked at the slides ahead of time, there are some questions at the end. Those are just there to get the juices flowing, but uh, you're welcome as a council, of course, to take the conversation wherever it needs to go. Uh, those are just there if, um, if we're at a loss for questions. Next slide. So the comprehensive plan is a plan for the city's physical development over a 20 year time frame. It's a strategy for accommodating population and employment growth and providing the infrastructure and other capital facilities necessary to serve that growth. It's a tool for interdepartmental and interjurisdictional coordination and also importantly, an opportunity for the city to engage the public and that includes residents, businesses, organizations, uh, outside agencies and more to develop and document its long-term goals and the actions that we intend to take to advance those goals. It's intended to be a long-term plan that provides a steady roadmap for the city. It's a lot of work to do the necessary analysis, coordination and outreach. In fact, it's a two year, uh, maybe even more work program. So we don't make major changes to the plan very often. The existing plan was adopted in 2015 for a planning period stretching out to 2035. So we're about halfway almost through that planning period. And we've only made minor tweaks since then. So it's really intended to be a, a stable guidepost for uh, the city's development and its, its operations. The periodic update process um, uh, that we're embarking on now advances that 20 year planning period. We're gonna be moving to a 2024. That's the year that we hope to adopt this plan. Um, and it would be for a 20 year planning period through 2044. 
Um, through that process, we accommodate a new increment of growth. Uh, the city, region, county, and state continue to grow uh, almost inevitably. And uh, of course, with every advancing of the planning period, there's a new increment of growth to accommodate. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about where those growth targets come from in a moment, but uh, suffice it to say that we have some uh, we have some growth targets that need to accommodate for that 20 year period population and employment uh, and, and employment targets. State law is con constantly changing uh, new requirements for planning are being added uh, procedural requirements uh, within the growth management act and other relevant portions of state law. Uh, usually those new requirements when they come online are not cities do not have to go ahead and immediately put them in their plan, but rather they're folded into this periodic update process. So every eight years, that's the cycle that the state is currently on. Um, the city would look and see what has changed with state law, and that's the time to incorporate and implement those new, uh, new requirements and responsibilities. <clears throat> Same thing for regional policies and uh, plans that we'll talk about in the next slide. It's, of course, an opportunity for us to look at the city's own vision and its goals and its policies. What is our uh, path to the future? And um, that, can, that can stay stable from plan update cycle to plan update cycle, or there can be a major change in direction if that's the way that the, our city's leadership is going, um, or it can represent incremental change, any of that. And then uh, the plan is based on an understanding of where we are now and where we've been in the recent future. So updating our inventories of uh, things like uh, things like our population counts and distribution and demographics, our uh, capital facilities inventories, what uh, water supply, uh, stormwater, wastewater, um, what, what's the situation with schools and, and some of the services and facilities provided by partner agencies. Um, and so it's a chance to take a look at all of that that's on the ground, refresh those inventories and publish them uh, as an integral part of the plan. <clears throat> and then the plan uh, is implemented by development regulations and maps, our zoning map, our maximum building height map, our street designations map. Um, and uh, all of those uh, get refreshed and updated with this periodic update and the development regulations that guide uh, private development and uh, city projects within, this, within the city are also updated. Uh, next slide, oh, here we go. Um, so the comprehensive plan exists within a framework that's established uh, under state law. So at, at the top there is the primarily the Growth Management Act, that there are other sections of state law that impact our comprehensive planning, including the Shoreline Master, Shoreline Management Act, the State Envi Environmental Policy Act, um, and then some of the more regulatory ones like the Land Use Policy Act or LUPA. Lots of different chapters of state law comprise the state's overall planning framework, but the Growth Management Act is certainly the most impactful for this particular process number of um, both substantive and procedural requirements in the Growth Management Act. Many of you may have heard of the uh, 11, I believe it is, goals that um, uh, all comprehensive planning within the state must orient towards. It's things like affordable housing and a healthy environment and efficient and effective public services and all of that. There's 11 of those. Um, and then there are, are substantive and procedural requirements in the Growth Management Act that guide just about everything below that. Within the Central Puget Sound region, King Pierce, Snohomish, and Kitsap counties, uh, Puget Sound Regional Council coordinates uh, a regional planning effort that um, includes multi-county planning policies. These are policies and a plan and a regional growth strategy of numeric population and employment distribution that uh, represents agreement on a general uh, path for the region as a whole, so that we're all generally rowing in the same direction um, as a region. So those multi-county planning policies then guide everything below that, the countywide planning policies, as well as the comprehensive plan. Countywide planning policies are prepared under the auspices of Snohomish County Tomorrow, which is the association of the Snohomish County all the cities within and the Tulalip tribes and 
Uh, we just completed a uh, major update to both of those uh, planning documents. Uh, I think that's in the next slide. So all of those things, uh, state law, the countywide multi-county planning policies guide and um, set a framework for our comprehensive plan. Underneath that are the development regulations and capital facility planning that the city undertakes. And that is what is, uh, that is how we implement uh, the comprehensive plan. So those project inputs, I mentioned state law, vision 2050, countywide planning policies. There's also some internal plans like our uh, housing action plan, rethink housing action plan that was adopted in late 2021, just a few months ago. Um, there are other functional plans, the park recreation and open space plan that uh, you recently heard a briefing on and will be acting on soon folds into the comprehensive plan. Um, we have detailed uh, plans for things like stormwater, uh, our water system plan, our sewer system plan, and things like that. All of those serve as inputs and context for the comprehensive plan update, as well as data. I mentioned needing to know where we are and where we've recently been. So we have Census 2020 um, that provides the most up-to-date uh, formal um, information on our population and the distribution within the city. Um, as you know, this was because of the pandemic, uh, a, a somewhat of a, a phased release and some of the most interesting data we are still waiting to see. So we know how many people, uh, all of the data necessary to do those, um, uh, those congressional district of reapportionments and all that are available now. But some of the interesting data, like um, just to give a very detailed example, how many uh, family households with children live in a certain census block group. Uh, we don't have that data yet, but we're expecting to have it later this summer. Uh, no, later this year. A ton of inform interesting information in there. Puget Sound Regional Council works with the State Employment Security Department to get uh, really good data on the number of jobs uh, that exist in, in the city. And they have those jobs down to a point level, although they are, um, they are uh, redacted to um, preserve employer uh, privacy. <clears throat> Buildable lands capacity. So the county in cooperation with the city does, an, does a state, man state mandated look at how much capacity we have for housing and employment growth. It looks back at the last five years of development and roughly at what density uh, within each different zone category uh, that development was achieving and then uses that information on recent observed trends to uh, make an estimate of future population and employment and housing capacity. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that in a moment. Um, and then lots of other sources of data. So those are important project inputs. Um, and then of course, uh, professional judgment and robust public participation and outreach program is all the data in the world only tells part of the story. Uh, we really need to know from you, the council, uh, and the, the residents and the stakeholders within the city of Everett, what direction uh, we would like to take the city. This is a big picture schedule. So I mentioned, uh, you can see all of those uh, yellow bars to the left of the, of the up and down dashed line, which is where we are today, are those uh, input projects processes that have recently completed. Vision 2050 was adopted in the closing uh, weeks of 2020. Uh, the countywide planning policies were adopted uh, by the county council who has the final adoption authority on that one um, earlier or late 2021. The growth targets which disaggregate a uh, an estimate of population and employment growth for the county through the SCT process. Um, that is up for a public hearing with the county council in two weeks or so. I want to say it was the third Wednesday in February. And um, Buildable Lands report was completed uh, last year as well. And so those are all kind of the inputs that were, that were slowly, we were watching and waiting and participating in these processes over a number of years going all the way back to 2017. And all of that was kind of building the foundation for now us to take all of those inputs and get to work on developing uh, our own comprehensive plan for the next 20 years. So 
that's just a little bit, well, a medium amount of background on, uh, on the foundation for the comprehensive plan. I'd like to turn it, turn it over to my colleague, uh, Rebecca, for um, an update on where we plan to go from here, what our, our process and schedule looks to be. Thanks, Yorick, and uh, thank you, Council. We're excited to be here tonight to, to share information about this project. And um, it, it's really exciting. It's a lot of work. It's uh, multi-year. And um, so I'm going to share with you how we've organized the work around getting this project done. Um, so we've divided it into uh, five distinct phases. So there are certain outcomes of each phase and each phase builds into the next phase. Um, so I'm just gonna briefly describe them. Um, we are in the phase one, early 20, 2022. So we're getting ready to issue our formal scoping notice. And what that means is um, we are going out to the community Going, coming to you, coming to the Planning Commission, other stakeholders, and really getting um, some early thoughts, uh, asking you know, what should we be focused on? Um, we will be asking folks, uh, talking about the alternatives that we're gonna be developing. And we are working on providing some examples of what those alternatives might look like. Um, so, we will start with uh, maybe uh, an alternative that would have most of the growth be concentrated along uh, frequent high capacity transit areas and within um, light rail station areas and, uh, and employment centers like the Southwest Industrial Center and also um, our downtown is considered a center, center under Vision 2050. So, we could create a growth scenario that would increase um, the ability to provide more employment and housing in those areas and less out into um, other parts of the city. And then the, old, the whole opposite alternative might be that, yes, we would do some concentration around those same areas, but that we would disperse growth um, out into the communities um, you know, we've talked about middle housing and how that might fit or where that might fit. So it's important that we keep the bookends very broad because we'll be studying what those uh, alternatives mean in terms of impacts to the community. Um, so the the main the boiling down to this uh, question is, you know, what should the update focus on? So you will see that come up here very, very soon as we um, get ready to issue that formal notice. Under phase two, we'll uh, take all of those comments, we'll take what we hear from you, we'll take what we hear from, um, from the Planning Commission and we'll start to formulate a couple of uh, alternatives that we wanna study. And so this is uh, going back and saying, okay, this is what we heard are these the right alternatives we should be studying that we should be looking at? That, that will happen uh, mid 2022. Under phase three, um, we will actually uh, look at the draft alternatives and we will have a uh, draft environmental impact statement, which is where we will analyze environmental impacts to uh, what those alternatives would mean to the city. And so that's a way for us to say which alternative performs the best or combination of those. Um, once we have that, then that goes out again for, uh, we will take it out for public review, for public comment. And by getting all of those comments back, then we will have uh, work on what we would call our, uh, the draft plan and um, a preferred alternative. So um, the question there is how did the preferred alternative, alternative perform? And that's still an opportunity at this stage to say, well, should we consider some other changes? Um, that way, when we get towards the adoption process, we've um, reviewed 
everything that um, could be part of the alternative. Um, and then finally launching into the the final phase, which is the adoption process, which will include the comprehensive plan. It'll include uh, the issuance of the final environmental impact statement, and it will include updated development regulations because our development regulations need to be consistent with our new comprehensive plan. So boiling that question down as council um, considers, planning commission and council considers that, does the plan reflect the public's input? Does it meet all the regulatory and policy requirements? And does it achieve, achieve our uh, growth goals? So I wanted to share with you too that this is a, a huge citywide team effort. We were able to <clears throat> launch our kickoff meeting with all of these teams and we've organized them around um, certain topics because we have a lot of subject matter experts in the city and and so it was fun to get that team together and really start to see how this uh, program would launch. <clears throat> Excuse me, the public participation is a major component of an outreach, um, a comprehensive outreach excuse me so we have built um several pieces of uh outreach uh items and um <clears throat> the workshop uh series we did that with the housing action plan um we will have a lot of focus groups and you know we would look to get some feedback from council members about that as well um, there is a, a large amount of agencies and consultants that we'll need to collaborate with. Um, the port, you know, Snohomish County PUD, there's just a number of other agencies that we need to make sure that we're including because they're also planning future and we need to be coordinated to that effort. We like to use existing boards and commissions because we feel like they're good ambassadors uh, out to their uh, neighborhoods. Um, so we will likely just, you know, come to some of those boards and commissions and share information about the project and get their feedback. Uh, we're planning outreach events. Unfortunately, we're, we're still in the COVID era. And we saw that with the housing action plan that it is challenging to get folks to, to participate. Um, when and if we have the chance to do some um, in person activities we certainly will um, for now though we're kind of limited to doing um, these events uh, virtually working with communications to make sure that our local media is is in touch and that um, they can help us get the word out and they can get information out social media obviously we use that for all of our stuff <clears throat> so I thought it was interesting that Washtet was using TikTok. I hadn't even considered that. Have to. <laughs> uh, um, we are we are building a wonderful project web page that we hope will be uh, very interactive. Um, we're going to be using um, a, something called story mapping so that we can sort of tell the story, and it's very uh, again interactive, and folks can can use the site to um, talk with us. We have a, um, created a, its own um, email address. We wanna make sure that we're putting enough information out onto that website, making sure the calendar is very clear so that people who want to stay engaged can continue to stay engaged. And then planning commission will have a major role in this process. This is. Um, this is really going to be their major work program item for the next two and a half years. And then city council briefings, which um, I will talk again about in one of our next slides. So I'm not going to cover this slide too much because uh, York has already done that. But again, this is the statutory requirements that we're, we're working under. Um, I should say that when we're developing alternatives, um, there still is 
some guidance that um, we pay attention to as we develop these alternatives um, so that we're making sure that we're going along and, and not ignoring them. <clears throat> Just some major observations uh, from the last two updates that the city did. There was um, largely no changes to the land use map um, in the last two updates. There was a lot of, um, there was a heavy lift for Everett last time as well because there was a huge um, population allocation that came here. And as such, you know, we have the buildable lands report that shows us showed us our capacity that's done in conjunction with the county. But um, for the last update, the city did its own separate land capacity, uh, not to um, dis disprove the buildable lands, but to work um, alongside it um, because we have probably more uh, intimate knowledge of certain things and how certain things look. So we will do that likely again, as we have another heavy lift to uh, accommodate. And then one of the things that's happened since the last update is Metro Everett. Um, and that has increased, uh, did increase uh, a lot of heights in the downtown. Um, there's new regulations there. So the, the rethink zoning was also done. So there's, um, when Yorick mentioned that the buildable lands bases its capacity on how well those zones performed over the past five years. That's, we're so early in our Metro Everett and our rethink that we're not um, entirely sure how that would maybe perform differently um, in the years coming up. So that'll be something that we'll take a look at um, as we do that other land capacity analysis. And um, this is the numbers. Um, here we're, we're giving you the 2020 census numbers. Um, and uh, some of you may know that our population was um, reduced under the 2020 census. So anyway, we're starting from a 2020 population of 110,000. Our population um, was expected for 2035 to be 165,000. When the land capacity analysis came through the billable lands, we were short um, capacity to accommodate 14,000 people. What that means is that we will have to take a look at what we call a reasonable measures process to bring the 2035 uh, into compliance, that number. Um, and then on top of that, we've got the new allocation so that by 2044, we would have 100 and our target is 179,000. Um, on the employment side, so that's a total of the new growth period then would, would need to accommodate 69,000, about 69,000 people. So that, that's just adding a, and adjusting the, the time period. For the employment, um, we did really well in terms of having the capacity for employment. So we weren't uh, short there. And so there's a, about another, uh, as we move the goalposts, I should say, um, to 2044, that means that we'll need to accommodate a total of 67,000 jobs. So we're in the process of determining what that means in terms of actual more capacity that we've got to add to, to, empl or to housing and to employment areas. That's just another way to take a look at it. Um, a graph showing um, the 2020, 2035, growth targets, then moving up to the 2044. And then the regional growth strategy does go to 2050. It's the GMA deadlines and the vision don't exactly match up. So. So one of the things that um, are important in this update, there are new policies, both in vision, I should say um, in GMA, envision and uh, at the countywide planning policy level and they will um, these will be the key topics in the areas of focus the growth 
capacity, and uh, I talked about the reasonable measures, the public participation, the housing affordability choice and exclusion. Definitely uh, we'll be working more towards um, evaluating policies and regulations that might, uh, that are good for equity, that don't have disparate impacts built in and um, making sure that we're taking uh, steps that we need to, to mitigate, mitigate minimize uh, displacement in areas. Um, there's the climate mitigation and adaption. And then as we all know, we're planning for light rail and transit oriented development. So uh, 2044, if, if all the funding goes well, that would be when the uh, transit, the light rail should be here to Everett. So um, next, this was a conversation that we wanted to have with you, um, Council's role as we move forward. Um, we definitely want to make sure that we're getting regular feedback and we're giving you regular information. Um, I understand that last week you um, established a planning committee. And so we would look to Council to tell us how we might um, use that committee to, to give updates and when would be appropriate to do that with the full council. So um, we'll look to you uh, for your guidance on, on how you'd like us to approach that. Um, we also would like your help in, in helping us reach out to the community. Um, if you have opportunities where you'd like us to participate um, and also if you get feedback from the community, um, we would love to have that too. We have a, we've created a, um, we have a database that we'll be using to track all of these comments. And we hope that we get just a ton of comments and that will make for a better plan um, and, and a better overall outcome. Um, and then just wanting your guidance as we uh, move through and propose things and, and provide you with that information. And of course, your your final role here is um, the approval of the document and getting it off to Commerce by June 30th of 2024. So with that, uh, here were the questions. Um, we did a similar exercise with the Planning Commission and um, there's a lot here, but you know, if anything, any of your initial um, thoughts come to mind. Um, we would welcome any of your thoughts. Uh, it could be at another time. You know, you can share that with us uh, via email or however you would like us to do that. But these are things that we would probably be asking all along through this process is, are we missing anything? Did we miss anything? Um, what are your priorities, both in terms of the process and the policies? Um, Another thing is, you know, what can we learn during the environmental analysis process? Um, we want to study, again, the bookend so that we can create that preferred alternative and that growth pattern um, that, that meets your priorities. Um, and then, as I mentioned before, we'd really like to get your ideas about how we can reach um, residents, businesses, other stakeholders, especially those marginalized community members, um, communities of color. Um, so we're really trying to make uh, an effort to include those folks and, and help them get interested in, in this subject. So with that, I can turn it back over to um, President Stonecipher. Thank you, and thank you, Yorick and Becky, for this great overview of the process. Let's go down the roll and see what questions our council members have for now. Um, and thank you for noting that we have this emphasis area. Um, and so we've got a group of three council members that'll probably be a little more engaged in this process as it unfolds, but we'll look forward to having some regular updates for the full city council um, as well, just to make sure everybody's in, in the know about what is happening um, at the planning commission level. Uh, let's uh, start first with council member Zerlingo. 
Well, of course, part of my focus is going to be on transportation infrastructure, and uh, I appreciate the briefing. That was a very good uh, briefing, good, good uh, introduction to the whole process and the length and comprehensiveness of it. Uh, the one thing, I spent some time looking over the maps, um, just trying to get a general overall idea of this and, and, and some impressions. And one of the things, I guess, any of us who've uh, driven to Seattle lately, uh, looking at the light rail, we certainly can see that thing has a big footprint. Um, tall and wide and shadows and just a big footprint and the specific alignments and some of the things like the operation and maintenance facility, uh, the final locations of that have not yet been settled. Um, but what I thought I would suggest to at least to, to consider putting on one of the maps uh, as we look at it would be the potential path for that light rail is is such a big thing and it's going to be affecting a lot of the growth and density um, and so even just kind of a heavy dotted line showing where that might be uh, would help us keep in mind that big that big thing that's going to sit on top of a lot of what we do uh, that's the main feedback i had and thank you again for the briefing thank you uh council member ryan Thank you. Yeah, I um, actually had a question too about the light rail. Um, so I know that the final path hasn't quite yet been determined. So I was wondering if there's um, room for flexibility with uh, specific areas where a light rail station might be, or if they decide to uh, change the route in the future, if we're going to be locked into a specific growth in an area based on where a light rail station may or may not be. That's my first question. Yeah, so we're working really closely with Sound Transit, uh, tons of meetings, lots of collaboration, lots of analysis. Um, we're at the phase right now, level one screening, and uh, we can come back or have Sound Transit come back and give a full briefing on the evolution of that uh, siting. But where we're at in general is that we know the four station locations, Airport Road and Evergreen Way, uh, Southwest Everett Industrial Center near Boeing and the airport, um, Evergreen Way and SR 526 and then downtown Everett. Those are the four, is that four? Yes, four station areas. For each of those, there are roughly four um, specific station locations that are still under consideration and being evaluated in the level one evaluation. Um, they're all fairly tightly clustered uh, around where the voters pamphlet from ST3 indicated they would go. So they're within a block or two, I think the biggest, uh, the biggest stretches in the Southwest Everett one. Um, they sound transit just completed an early scoping process so we talked about our early or our scoping process where we ask what the uh guide guide at the end posts <laughs> another word for that anyways uh, the, the the bookends on the uh on the on the station and alignment and operations and maintenance facility location will be they did get a lot of comments that would move the line very significantly off of where it's expected to go, which is generally Airport Road, SR 526, and then I-5 up to downtown. Um, they're running through those through an evaluation criteria, but I don't expect major changes to what was, because there's a real heavy thumb placed on the scale where uh, what the voters approved in, what, five years ago or so. That where the stations wind up is going to play a big role in our growth pattern. Um, we're working closely with Sound Transit, and we have a lot of internal policies and and, and others about supporting the, that multi-billion-dollar investment with substantial development oriented around that. And it's a a, a good way to catalyze new neighborhoods and um, take advantage of the new transportation accessibility that we'll have. Did I get anywhere near the, the, the you question? did yeah thank you um <laughs> i definitely have plenty of my own opinions on where the stations should be but i'll save that for a completely different conversation um <laughs> so the um let's see the notes that i wrote down um i would love to see in the plan um as we plan ahead for um a housing boom coming and more building more units for folks i'd love to see uh, green building uh, prioritized and ways to incentivize green building and green roofs and uh, lead certifications and those types of housings, especially for larger apartment facilities or larger uh, housing facilities, just to mitigate the compounding impacts that a, a large building like that would have on the environment and also uh, ensuring that the landscaping and the 
um, greenery around buildings like that is either maintained or there can be ways to um, bolster and boost uh, tree canopies other places in the city so that uh, just to mitigate any um, environmental impacts that they might be having with moving in. So I'd love to see that included and also prioritization for infill housing and development in the downtown core. I think uh, that'll be very important. And um, what else do I have? Uh, I'm sure it's included as underneath the uh, existing boards and commissions for public participation, but also like to uh, make sure that uh, using our neighborhood associations uh, for outreach is also included on that. And we're all uh, liaisons to the neighborhoods in our in our district. So we'd be, I'm, <laughs> Lisa, I'll be, I don't want to put work on anybody, but I'm sure we'd be happy to uh, reach out to the neighborhood associations in our group. And I also, as far as uh, public participation and public input is concerned, um, I think it's really important to um, allow opportunities for the city to reach out instead of expecting folks to reach in to the city regarding the process because a lot of folks might not know that this is going on. So uh, reaching out to organizations that um, are already, you know, have a good uh, group of people and um, a number of people that they would that they could spread the message to I think would be really helpful and I'm sure our communications team or some other folks with the uh, city already have a, a good listing of just you know, book clubs and <laughs> um, other just smaller groups in the area that already have a, a following that can help with getting the messaging out. So that is my three cents for the day. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Council Member Vogley. I was just going to lean back and listen to everybody, but I'm right after Council Member Ryan today. So um, thank you so much. It was really, it is really nice seeing you again, York and Becky. Um, real quick, I saw Judy's hand up, and I'm one. Okay, never mind that. Um, comprehensive plan is exactly what it states. It's very comprehensive, and so therefore, just about every single thing that we can think of to run a city would go into it. Um, so a few of my key words that I wish for you to take away today, uh, vehicle free zones. Um, that is something that people travel far and wide for in different countries. And um, by golly, we've got a great country right here. So we can also have one of those. Paris, Milan, Everett, you know, you've seen the bags. Um, protected bike lanes. Uh, people are, you know, whether there's cars or not, people need to be able to um, travel and travel safely. Um, so you're just going to continually hear this from me, protected bike lanes. I know there's a very large constituency that has been requesting and requesting and requesting. And I think a comprehensive plan is a great place to put that. I know that the bike master plan is going to be gone over again with the comprehensive plan and other plans that I can't think of right now. Uh, well, and the tree canopy, right? So if the uh, resolution or the letter gets signed on to next week, or maybe we do it tonight just really quickly, I don't know. Um, <laughs> I know that's not going to happen making sure that it is written that, you know, even if there are going to be trees that are cut down, but that is no reason not to plant more and also not to build housing. So we need the housing. We need the tree canopy. We need more trees where there haven't been any. I know that you all know this, but not everybody does. Um, transit is also a part of comprehensive planning. And um, I just want to put out there, and I'm going to quote Twitter, <laughs> demands of transit frequency are a poison pill for adding housing. So I know that we talk about transit-oriented development, and it is, it is a good idea to have frequent transit near development. But if there's no reason to use it because you can't get anywhere. You know, it's a fine line. So it sounds good like, oh, definitely build it where there's massive transit. We need to build the housing 
and we need to build the transit and we have maybe not the means, but we have the ideas to do it and we need to get the means. Um, and it looked like you said, uh, actually, I know you said, because I heard it, the, our, our count, our population count went down. Um, and that's just curious. Uh, what's curious about that is our unhoused population has gone up. And I'm not sure what the exact numbers are right now. Um, and I don't know how the census works with unhoused population, because I'm sure not even every housed person was counted um, just because not everybody's always counted. So housing is so incredibly needed at all price points. You know that, blah, blah, blah. There goes Vogley talking again, but having much experience with many unhoused folks at this time is we just we need the density people so we need there is a senate bill or a house bill um right now that would require um just plain old residential zoning to bring it down to just total layman terms residential zoning you can build places to live where you can build places to live. Um, so I'm looking forward to that passing, but if it doesn't, I would look forward to Everett passing that type of thing in a comprehensive plan. Um, and <laughs> one last thing, uh, annexation has been spoken about. I don't know where we are on even thinking about that, but um, I think it's still being thought about and I know some people are pushing it although maybe small. So where would that fit in to a comprehensive plan? And when would, I mean, it seems like it would probably take at least as long and then the comprehensive plan would be approved in June, 2024. And then we'd have like, you know, 50,000 more people. Here. So um, that is what I have for you. No questions, just all comments. And I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, my apologies. My dog is getting excited over here. Um, she's excited about the comprehensive plan. Uh, Council Member Schwab. I guess, um, I guess just to add uh, to what already has been spoken, um, I've been particularly interested in um, developing or evaluating um, the area of Evergreen Way between 41st and uh, 526. So I really think there's some opportunity there, whether it be a, a, a lot of the subjects been brought up, um, canopy style, um, dedicated bus lane, um, look at rezoning on both sides. So I really think there's, there's some opportunity there. Thank you, uh, Council Member Fossey. Okay, uh, so I'm gonna need a little bit of clarification, but first off, I wanna say thank you so much for that wonderful overview and presenting this. This makes my job and committee <laughs> so much easier. Really appreciate it, that was awesome. Um, so uh, with regard to the outreach, um, I mean, obviously that's like so important to have community input. And uh, I know that y'all are gonna really like kind of champion that. Um, love workshops and public education is like a huge, you know, important part, uh, just key to this whole process. So I'm sure that a lot of my fellow council members would agree that the comp plan um, is a priority for this body. And I noticed on the city website, city council uh, web page, the landing page, we don't actually have any priorities there. And I know other cities do that. So at some point, maybe we could put that on the docket. So when people are like, hey, what is city council up to? Oh, they're looking at the comp plan. How could I participate? Click. Other cities do that. That might be another avenue to provide a little bit more education. So just a suggestion. Happy to talk more about that offline with anyone. Uh, but when it comes to 
single family zoning, because I do see a lot of yellow on there. And I know that, am I correct in that we went through the rethink zoning um, and then the amendments to the single family zones, like zone consolidation and all of that new housing types, you put that on hold and then it was resumed with rethink housing and then with our housing action plan made a lot of uh, suggestions about adjusting the, the city zoning and um, more inclusionary zoning and everything to kind of, is that going to play into the comp plan and what we do going forward? And I can pause with the rest of my stuff if somebody wants to speak to that. Yeah, Becky, go ahead. Um, yeah, so you're correct in the housing action plan, there was a number of recommendations about um, a lot of housing stuff, but um, in particular, the single family zones and those were consolidated under rethink. And then there was um, a proposal that didn't move forward in rethink that would have changed some of the single family, family zoning. Um, so that is something that we will be uh, including in the comprehensive plan and alternatives so that we can get folks to take a look at what that means, what that might look like. So this is how, how we will incorporate it uh, in terms of um, laying it out for the public and showing them what that would look like um, and, and getting their feedback. So did that answer your Yes. Question. Yes. I just love the cute little courtyard apartments that have like a little garden center fan. Uh, so uh, that's helpful. Um, I was also wondering if the periodic update had any impact on any of our freight routes. There will be a, uh, a full transportation component to this. Um, so uh, obviously we'll, we're going to lean heavily on our, our transportation team, public works department to take a look at our transportation system, our 20 year project list, refreshing the six year project list, uh, coordination with the state. Um, we have a system of freight routes established through a freight master plan that I believe is getting a little bit long in the tooth. Not sure where our capacity and priorities lie in that in that area, uh, and whether we'll do a full detailed look at it or just some nibbles around the edges and 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 tweaks. But transportation is a core component of the of the comprehensive plan and of the update. So there will be at a minimum a review and a update if necessary of the freight master plan and the freight routes if not something more significant, just depending on the resources. And there's a lot to look at in transportation and everything else. Okay, uh, last one. Uh, I know that uh, council member Roberts had previously proposed something to do with uh, ad hoc committees to kind of help um, provide additional staffing. Is that something that's being considered moving forward? Yeah, so Councilmember Roberts, I think he got all the way to holding a first meeting or two. Um, he had proposed and I think uh, chatted with other council members about using the districts as an organizing framework for uh, for coordination and participation, uh, a way for the city to connect to a kind of a medium small group of people that would then connect uh, back down to the ground level. I would, uh, I, that's something that we can work on. I would, I would turn to the council and the mayor to, uh, to give us guidance on establishing new frameworks like that. Okay. And here's our mayor. I'll just, yeah, I'll just <laughs> jump in. Um, yeah, that was a, it was a great idea that council member Roberts had. And I guess I would put it in the council's hands to implement that, that we do not have staff resources to create another engagement system like that, but each council member would be very welcome. And I, as, I, as our team shared, we would love each of your support in reaching um, your districts. And so if you wanted to organize uh, uh, many uh, town halls or, or ways to connect with your district and, and go over this, that would be fantastic. Um, and I'm sure staff could help provide the resources to have successful conversations there, but um, we don't have extra team members to kind of help organize that. I think we would rely on you either working with your district directly or with your neighborhood groups in your district. Thank you.
Oh, sorry, I was muted. We'll move to Council Member Dewey. <laughs> Thank you, Council President. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, always enjoy hearing more about all this and uh, appreciate uh, how well you guys communicate with us. I really do. So I just have a big concern um, and uh, with looking at some of what our neighbors are doing, and, I, and I'm talking about uh, around the Alderwood Mall area with their amount of high density at the mall and right next to the mall and then the big box stores that they put in and really um, you know the streets I, I just don't see that they've really taken into consideration that the traffic that it doesn't matter that the people live there without a vehicle people travel because of the mall and the big box stores that are right there and it's it's just crazy. And the people haven't even moved into all those hundreds of apartments yet. So, um, you know, that makes me nervous and it makes me think, I think we can do uh, a better planning than what looks to me like scary. And so I just want to make sure, and you brought up about the transit, um, about the, the traffic uh, control people would be taking a good look at this. And I think that's just so important because you don't realize impact as much as we want people to take transit and to walk and ride bikes you're still if you add 800 apartments or housing units you're still going to end up with 400 of them driving at least so um, anyway that's my big concern and I think if we can look at some of our neighbors and some of the projects that we think turned out really well and some that that didn't uh, that we can certainly learn from from them so that's it Thank you. Thank you. And I don't have much to add. I want to thank uh, your, you and Becky for being here to give us uh, an update on this. Um, and I, I look forward to scheduling some interim briefings. I'll probably rely on our committee uh, to decide when those uh, should occur here. Um, it'll be interesting to me to see how we talk a little bit about uh, planning for bicycle infrastructure, um, the bike plan that we have. I know we need to update it, but I do spend a lot of time in Seattle um, in my day job uh, traveling through there and uh, some of the improvements that they've made with the separated bike lanes and while well, at times as a driver, it can be a little confusing. Um, I'm, I do see that it really um, creates a much safer environment for the bikes who are using those, um, those protected lanes. So it'd be interesting to see how we might do that. I don't know uh, how you implement that without a full scale revamping of many of the main corridors, but it could be something interesting for us to look at. So I'll look forward to seeing how we think, uh, you know, future wise about that. And then the other question I have is within the time frame that this comprehensive plan is um, looking at, we could be facing autonomous vehicles and some other really sort of out there um, technology changes. I don't know about drone operations and what those may be bringing to our uh, community with, you know, deliveries or, I mean, I don't know if that would be, you know, delivering people. Um, so I'd be curious to see how uh, you think a little bit outside just sort of the normal um, planning uh, constructs into some of these a little bit more uh, innovative and probably, you know, whether they actually come to pass or not in the way that we think they will. But I'd like to see how we um, can take into account some of those um, other technological improvements that you know, are at least being bantied about. And I, I think it makes sense to imagine how they would fit into our planning, uh, our plans if they come about. So I'd like to see a little bit of that. Those are all of our questions. Uh, Council Member Zerlingo, I see your hand up. Just a real quick note that we've heard quite a bit about uh, bikes or uh, 
questions and issues with respect to bikes. And you were just talking about technology changes. And one of the changes that's really happening rapidly there is that the e-bikes, which are typically left allowed where bikes are, are rapidly becoming motorcycles uh, effectively in terms of power and range and speed. So, uh, I mean, I'm, maybe that's a good thing. It's a thing. It's going to be a rather big thing, I think, with respect to anything in bike or protected lanes, and that can even apply to scooters. So uh, I'd like to see us keep that in mind as well, because we're certainly going to see that technology change uh, happen uh, much more rapidly now. Thank you. Um, and that's, I think, all the comments. So we will uh, look forward to seeing the, the progress of this work. The planning commissioners have a lot ahead of them. Um, I have served on the planning commission, but I was not involved in the comprehensive plan at that time. So um, best of luck to them as they carry out that really important work. And, and um, thank you for bringing this to our attention. This brings us to the end of our agenda, uh, as noted at the start of the meeting. And as you can see on the screen here, there are many ways to contact the council uh, it, for ways to reach out to us and also to watch, listen, or participate in our weekly meeting. Uh, main conduit to reaching us is to call the council office at 425-257-8703 or you can email uh, Deb Williams at dwilliams at everettlaw.gov. And with no further business and no executive session, we are now adjourned.